And as I said, I want to talk a little bit for uh, Israelis. It might be a little bit boring, but uh, I think it's a good thing to uh, talk at the beginning about the Israeli framework, legal framework of how the terrorism law, uh, especially in the light of the fact that this is a topic that is becoming uh, very relevant in many other countries which didn't suffer or which didn't have such a phenomena very similar to what we have here for the last hundred years, basically. So European countries, France, Germany, other countries are now examining uh, the counter-terrorism law. Uh, we had an uh, earlier wave uh, prompted by 9-11 in which uh, the Americans changed significantly the counter-terrorism law uh, as well as the British. Uh, and uh, what I want to say in the beginning is that uh, basically uh, what um, you are experiencing in uh, Europe is something that uh, basically uh, almost going to celebrate a millennium uh, in this part of the land, um, in Israel, Palestine. Uh, terror activities began Uh, terrorist activities began in the 1920s, uh, which is also an interesting phenomena after the British conquest of Palestine and the Balfour Declaration. Uh, it began with uh, massive attacks on Jews in, uh, in, Pal in all British mandatory Palestine, where there more than 100, 100 Jews in Hebron, basically eliminating the Jewish uh, presence there. Uh, this was prompted by um, you know, we tend to view terrorism in Israel as a Palestinian and Arab phenomena. By the way, all terrorist activities in the last hundred years, or virtually almost all terrorist activities, are on the background of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict or Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, but there is also Jewish terrorism, which we should undermine. And following uh, the 1920s, uh, Etzel organization, which is a terrorist organization, was established. Uh, uh, began operating with their activities uh, against uh, Arab population and retaliation activities, and afterwards also against 1939 against the British. And this prompted basically one of the legs of the counterterrorism law that still is in force today, which is the defense emergency regulation that the British enacted in 1939 and amended in 1944. Um, uh, a second leg of uh, uh, counterterrorism law in Israel, which I will elaborate a little bit, is the Prevention of Terrorism Act, which is a, which was enacted very f uh, uh, shortly, a few months after the establishment of the state of Israel, over one weekend, and this uh, was following uh, the assassination of uh, the UN envoy to this area, called Kebenadot, by an offspring of the Etzel. Uh, terror organization called Lehi, offspring that was established because the Etzel during the Second World War decided not to fight the Brits, and an offspring uh, formed uh, in intention to kick the Brits out of here. Uh, and this Prevention of Terrorism Act was used harshly and basically eliminated within, within a few months this uh, terror, Jewish terror, terror organization, uh, uh, Lehi. And then we have in the 50s and the early 60s terror that was mainly by infiltrators from uh, uh, the Arab neighboring uh, countries after the setup of the borders following the independence war. Uh, and uh, terror activity changed significantly following the occupation of uh, the West Bank in Gaza in the 1967 war, uh, which brought terror. Uh, many terror activities from within or from within the occupied territories. And what we also have an interesting phenomenon which is connected to today's terrorism is the internalization of terrorism with the establishment of the PLO in 1964 and its connection with other terror organizations like the Bader Meinhof Group and other organizations. We have a period of another period of Jewish terrorism in the 1980s, Jewish underground, and other terror organizations. Uh, and we have 
change of their uh, format following the Oslo Accords in uh, 1994, uh, where unfortunately and ironically uh, the accord between Israel and PLO brought about a massive terror attacks and a change of structure of the terror attacks to suicide bombers. Uh, and, and the period between 1994 uh, and 2000 was a period in which many or many most of terror victims uh, the highest number of terror victims per year uh, were counted uh, in, in this area. Uh, and in, 19, in 2007, Israel withdrew from Gaza, and their terror attacks of what is perceived by Israeli as terrorism uh, changed its nature uh, from attacks, suicide attacks, to launching of rockets. We should we can talk about this and that this is considered a terrorist attack. And uh, we have uh, in the last two years, also an interesting change mode, mode of change of what is perceived as terror activities, not any more activities by organization, terror organization, but still acts of terrors by individual knives uh, running over, uh, and retaliation by uh, Jewish terrorists, uh, what is termed in the Israeli uh, new um, media, uh, price tag activities. So you see remnants of all these modes of terror, whether it's knives uh, uh, running, uh, running over, uh, suicide bomber, uh, and stuff like that in other countries as well. And therefore, I think they uh, need a framework for uh, the analysis of uh, um, counter terrorism law in Israel uh, might be of interest. You know, you know that the first suicide bomb was actually a Jew. Or well, one time is the first person who went into he didn't explode himself, but yeah. went into knowing that he would be killed. He, and then we talked about the the statistics <laughs> that defied the uh, <laughs> victims, but he, you know, he killed and he, he shot and he, he, he didn't explode himself. Yeah, okay, we can we can talk about whether this is the same thing and but merit the same response. <coughs> to put <coughs> counterterrorism law in theoretical perspective, we basically distinguish between three different models <coughs> with regard to counterterrorism law uh, that operates in different countries. And these are not exclusive models, it's theoretical model. And I'm talking now on the positive level, we can talk later on, on which model is to be preferred. Uh, one model is business as usual, which means that no need for a real change of the law, of the rule of law under extreme condition or under terror attack or under terror period. We just amend regular legislation to face the problems, the new problems uh, that are occurring. Uh, and uh, the American Patriot Act is an example for that. The American Patriot Act was, was an uh, very cumbersome legislation that was enacted within a few months after 9-11, actually, three or four months. But it is a regular legislation. It was supposed to end the sunset clause, but it was extended upward, and now it's regular part of legislation. We have Prevention of Terrorism Acts in Britain uh, with new additions, last one from, the, from a few years ago. Again, these are part of the regular system of law. A different model, uh, which is practiced in many countries, is emergency constitution. Emergency constitution means that if we face an extreme condition, uh, uh, we switch, we make a switch to different rules, different laws that come into effect, as well as different procedures for decision making, especially rule making, that is delegated usually from the parliament to the government, when uh, this extreme condition or emergency uh, is enforced for a very uh, short period of time, uh, harsh measures can be uh, uh, taken during this period, but when this period ends, we go back to normality. Um, emergency constitution originate from the Roman model, uh, the Roman Republic had uh, a procedure when anticipating war, they can 
appoint a dictator, uh, abandoning all the regular procedural and uh, decision making uh, rules. The dictator can do whatever he or he always wants to do in order to achieve preparation for war or to fight the war. But after six months, exactly, the dictator had to go home and normality was restored, and there was a very, very uh, um, uh, detailed account of separation between emergency rule and uh, regular rule. The Weimar Republic ended with such a declaration when the Nazis came to power because of uh, emergency constitution, uh, and this brought uh, criticism of uh, Karl Schmidt, for example, uh, criticism on liberal democracy, if there is a person or a body that holds the switch to turn from normality to uh, emergency, then of course the sovereignty is not within the people or within the legislature and so forth and so on. We see still constitu emergency constitution even in the new Federal Republic of Germany constitution, but it's much more limited. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a possible second model. Uh, for handling emergency or extreme conditions. And the third model is stepping outside the rule of law. Uh, we have an emergency, we have extreme conditions, we don't have laws in order to uh, uh, look uh, and take, tackle these extreme conditions. So we step outside completely the rule of law, trying to legitimize or leg legalize what was conducted uh, uh, ex post. And as I said, these are conceptual models, and in practice, you see countries actually uh, having a combinations of these two models. For, for, for example, in the US, on one hand, there is not hardly any emergency constitution, but business as usual model is very prevalent, as I uh, explained, the Patriot Act, which is regular part of legislation. But on top of it, there is a notion of prerogative power of the president who can under emergency basically do almost everything. Uh, so there are the combination of stepping outside the rule of law and business as usual. France, the same, the uh, recent attacks in uh, France in Paris prompted uh, the entering into a force of emergency constitution. But in France, you have also uh, Article 14 of the French constitution, which basically enables the president unlimited power. And from our, from my perspective, we can talk about it later. This is stepping outside the rule of law, even if the prerogative powers are expressly uh, mentioned in the constitution. So you have the combination of these two models. Israel, I think, can be characterized, and this is one. Uh, yeah, I will skip some of these slides, but we can talk about them uh, later. I think also in international law, you can actually. Uh, uh, notice the three models. Laws of war are basically business as usual because these are laws that are always there. Okay, they are prescribed ex ante, and one of the questions that is going to uh, uh, discuss here is whether they are sufficient to anticipate various uh, tactics or various uh, technologies uh, that were not thought about in advance. Uh, derogation in uh, international uh, human rights law, in, in human rights, we are basically emergency equivalent to emergency constitution. Okay? There is an emergency, we cannot abide by the, uh, uh, by the obligations that we took upon ourselves for a limited time, uh, and therefore we derogate from uh, the uh, treaty, uh, the European, the international, the American treaty of human rights, and so forth and so on. Uh, and international practice is basically stepping outside the rule of law. If we look at what happened in Yugoslavia, if we look at what, what happened in Iraq, the coalition actually uh, um, uh, attacked both these places without legal authority as prescribed by the international law rules, security council decisions, and so forth, and bypassing the rule of law trying to legitimize or legalize this exposed. And so it's interesting to talk about these three models. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and by the way, please feel free if you have questions, remarks, comments in a small group, it shouldn't be necessarily a, a lecture and then you may. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, I have a question on your sort of foundation. Um, because I said, as I said, I'm working with authoritarian systems, and in both cases, Russia and China, the rule of law is sort of contested. Um, would you define the rule of law as exist as an existing condition of these models, or what would we what, what would happen to these models if we didn't have a rule of law in the first place? Or are, would could you just say yeah, the rule of law is a foundation? Okay, the rule of law is a very very complicated concept. I think there are two facets of the rule of law. The, the formal facet means that any use of authority by officials have to be grounded in laws, in norms, which are uh, uh, prospective, which are publicly, uh, uh, <coughs> publicly declared and published uh, by a legislator or a body that makes specially makes and so on and so forth and so on. And that individuals are free to do whatever they want to do unless they uh, are not are prohibited by law to do something, which means that basically law covers every human activity, both individuals and government. But this is only the formal facet of the rule of law, because under the formal facet, like in Russia and China, you can have, especially in China, not in Russia, in Russia, I think the problem is the gap between law in the books, law in action. In China, they don't accept even, they, they accept the formal facet of the rule of law, but under the formal facet of the rule of law, the prohibition on individuals are very, very massive, and the powers granted to the authority by law are also very, very broad. So we say that the substantive part of the rule of law is that even if something was given to the authority, the power was given to the authority to do something, invalidating individual rights, it has to be curtailed, justified, and reviewed by a system of separation of powers, independent courts, constitution courts, and so forth. So, so human rights, the protection of human rights, is part of the substantive facet of the rule of law. And of course, there, Russia and China are not very uh, not, perform, not performing very well. But yes, the question is this categories are funded upon, upon the foundation of the rule of law. And I must say that you know, as a, some, some of the law economics, uh, the quality of the rule of law, uh, which is already a positive normative argument, the quality of the rule of law is the number one predictor for a success of society, not the democracy. Uh, a country can be very successful in terms of GDP, macro indicators, happiness, if it maintains the rule of law, regardless of the question whether people elect their government. Uh, and therefore, we look at the rule of law as a very, very important and fundamental concept. And again, the concept is not uh, agreed upon, definition of the concept is not agreed upon by everyone. So I give you a gist of uh, the questions here. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll save this uh, <coughs> to the uh, end of the lecture. Uh, what characterizes Israel counterterrorism law is uh, these factors. First of all, and to this, I think you can say the credit of uh, the state of Israel, that it uses the combination of business as usual and emergency constitution, and it doesn't use the stepping outside the rule of law. Maybe there are one or two incidents in which uh, the rule of law was stepped out, but, you, but we don't have this concept of prerogative power, we don't have a concept of government or a person in charge that can do whatever he or she wants to do in order to tackle the emergency. We follow the rule that thing or the formal layer of the rule of law. Every power of the government has to be granted by law uh, and it might be an emergency law but by law. So we play around these two models. Constitution, emergency constitution on one hand and business and duty on the other hand. The second feature uh, which is quite interesting is that most of the legislation, most of the Israeli counterterrorism law is very old. We have the British defense regulations, as I mentioned, that were inherited by the state of Israel when Israel was established. 
we have the Prevention of Terrorism Act that was enacted uh, uh, by the interim government even before the first election in 1948. And until very recently, these were the main legal pillars of counterterrorism law. Uh, in 2005, there was an addition of uh, a financing of terrorism, which I relate to later. Uh, but the tools, the legal tools, are quite old, and we will use actually the Israeli Parliament uh, abolish some of these powers. Uh, however, the Knesset uh, just last month approved a new counterterrorism law, comprehensive that will repeal, replace the old Prevention of Terrorism Act as well as the Finance of Terrorism Act, and it will come to, into force on the first of November. Uh, so I will take and say a few things about the comparison between the new legislation. Uh, it's a massive legislation, so it's the first time the Israeli legislature really deals with the question. Uh, and it has some advantages and some disadvantages, which I will uh, uh, elaborate a little bit later. Basically, counterterrorism law comprises two main segments. One is a special penal code that referred related or applied to terror activities, both individual activities with terror acts and the organization of people into a terror organization, as well as uh, administrative measures, on which I will talk in a second, uh, that can be taken ex ante or ex post to the perceived terror threat. Another uh, important component, I think maybe the most important component, and this relates exactly to uh, you know, the question of the rule of law uh, and the question of the law in the books versus law in action. Another characteristic of Israeli counterterrorism law is a very massive involvement of, in the application of the law, scrutiny of the application of the law by the courts, which I think is a unique Israeli phenomenon. Uh, the courts in Israel can intervene even in the middle of a um, military operation uh, um, and rule that this operation is illegal, illegal or suspended operation uh, and um, the counterbalance uh, of the courts on the usage of the draconic power that exists in the law uh, is something very unique to Israel. You won't find it other countries uh, in the US, and, and this has both procedural and theoretical or, or philosophical uh, uh, reasons. Procedural because if you want, for example, to attack, uh, to review or to attack a, a, a respond, a quick respond activity of the American forces against uh, terror, you have to apply first to a local federal court and then continue to the uh, court of Appeal and then continue to the Supreme Court. This will take years and this makes it uh, irrelevant anymore. Uh, the Israeli uh, uh, structure is such that you can approach on the spot immediately directly the Israeli Supreme Court sitting as a high court of justice and talk about the background of this <coughs> arrangement and to get a relief within hours. So the court can really interfere with the actions of the government on the spot immediately and therefore it has a, a real input into the outcome, policy outcome of the actions of the government. And this is the procedural explanation. The substantive explanation is that uh, Israeli courts from the very beginning were willing to intervene also in governments actually in times of emergency. Again, unlike from, uh, for example, American courts in which in in which there is a concept of deference. There is extreme conditions. We are not doing anything. We are uh, deferring the power to uh, the administration. And uh, I think from a court intervention perspective, these are two pillars. And here I'm talking about the democratic world in general and, and not about the uh, uh, situations in, in non-democratic countries, China, Russia, and um, so I think these are the main characteristics of uh, the Israeli counterterrorism law. And um, a few words about 
the two basic uh, theoretical pillars, the emergency constitution. Okay? And again, what is interesting also is the difference between law in books as well as versus law in action. Okay? Uh, the emergency constitution in Israel basically, from a theoretical perspective, is a very, very nice, on a democratic theory, arrangement. Okay? If there is an emergency, okay, uh, the government, the, the Knesset, can declare a state of emergency. And if the Knesset is unable to convene for that purpose, the government can declare a state of emergency, which has to be approved by the government within seven days. Uh, and this emergency declaration is in power for one year. Okay. And what does it mean, a state of emergency? Basically, two consequences. First consequence is that it brings into force pre-existing legislation that is valid only under a declaration of emergency. For example, the emergency, uh, the Prevention of Terrorism Act from 1920. 48 is enforced only when there is an emergency. Or the administrative detention law uh, from 1979 is valid only during time of emergency. Emergency uh, stops, then these laws are not in effect. Okay? So there are various laws, and I'm not now talking about the most used one, the commodities and services, uh, but there are various laws that are coming into effect when emergency and are uh, basically not in effect or not applicable when emergency is not. A second uh, uh, consequence of declarations of emergency is procedure, changing procedure of decision making or rule making basically. Usually rule making general norms are made by the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, three readings, deliberation, and so forth and so on. During emergency power, the government has the power to legislate, even individual minister, to issue emergency regulation that basically can supersede uh, any existing law, but these regulations are enforced up to a three months period. And if they are extended by the parliament and its regular legislation, if not, they expire. So, uh, and uh, according to basic law, the government emergency regulation can impose either retroactive punishment or by a no violation of human dignity, and they are subject to judicial review. And indeed, the court, the Israeli Supreme Court, from the very beginning of the state, said that it is willing to review the use of emergency powers, uh, 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 emergency regulation, and other uh, uh, aspects of it. First, only on procedural grounds, but then later on, also on substantive grounds. Yeah, there's just one, one comment here. Um, a law can resist emergency regulation, any statute can resist emergency, it declares it. Right. So it's not any security provided that the law doesn't. Yeah. And, and many laws do say that emergency yeah. regulations do not apply. Yeah, the Knesset law itself, but it's not Knesset, the immune from emergency regulation. Okay. So, uh, a good remark, because this shows you that basically it's the structure of emergency regulation is quite impressive on the books. Uh, it has a declaration of emergency, it has basically checks and balances. It's not that the government can declare emergency. It's Parliament to declare emergency, there is a limited period of time, there is a judicial review even in emergencies specified by the law, and so forth and so on. The problem that on the ground, law in actions, that the declaration of emergency was made in 1948 uh, with the establishment of the state in the midst of the independence war, and basically was extended by the parliament, by the Knesset, every year since. So we are in a constant state of emergency since the establishment. State. Uh, in 1999, the Association of Supervising Israel petitioned the High Court of Justice uh, saying that this extension of almost automatic extension of emergency uh, is against the substantive facet of the rule of law. And following criticism of the High Court of Justice, the government uh, promised uh, to update all legislation and to bring to uh, the old legislation so that the declaration of emergency uh, will be 
as a ground for its abolishment. Uh, and we're still in this process. But the Prevention of Terrorism, the new Counterterrorism Act 2016, which I will talk about, is not contingent. This is one of the differences between the old Anti-Terrorism Act and the new one. The new one is not contingent on emergency declaration. Okay, so this is part of the government's response to the court uh, remarks, criticism. Uh, okay, we enacted now the Counterterrorism Act, but now the Counterterrorism Act in Israel is like the Patriot Act, the Prevention of Terrorism Act. It is permanent legislation. Okay. Um, so uh, we can talk about it, whether this is a good or a bad from a normative perspective. Uh, a few words about the different pillars of counterterrorism. No, as I said, the only one is the defense regulation, which enacted by and which were enacted by the Brits uh, as a response to the mounting tension in Palestine. But we find it's quite interesting. It is also an interesting area for uh, comparative reasons. We found very similar emergency regulation in other dis uh, disturbance, disturbed parts of the world which were held by the British before uh, the Second World War. Uh, Cyprus has very similar uh, regulation. Northern Ireland, uh, very similar regulations. Uh, India and Pakistan, uh, very similar, and still have enforced very similar regulations. Uh, and uh, again, the comparative perspective would be to show, will we try to see which country really repealed or changed or amended these regulations altogether. Uh, Israel did some amendments, uh, but not very significant. We'll talk about in a second. Okay. Uh, for example, the power to deport within Israel uh, was abolished. Now, what is interesting here, you know, our terrorism problems mainly or primarily or significantly focused in the occupied territories, and the British emergency regulations are in force in the occupied territories as well. Because as Israel inherited them from the Brits, the Jordanian and the Egyptian inherited them from the Brits and they didn't repeal them. So when Israel occupied uh, in 1967 the West Gap Bank in Gaza, the regulations were there as part of the municipal law. And unlike Israel proper, in which many of these regulations were changed, some of them abolished, the regulations are as they're almost as their original version uh, 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 in the occupied territories. What does the emergency regulation include? They include uh, <coughs> a penal code for security related offenses. Uh, originally, the jurisdiction was by a military court. Originally, there was no appeal. This was changed in Israel in 1963. This was one of the amendments to the emergency regulation. In 1989, it was changed also with regard to the occupied territories following the petition of the Association of Civil Rights in Israel. Uh, uh, and this is very important because uh, these offenses that are included in the emergency regulation are very draconic. Uh, they have many offenses that have equivalent in the General Penal Code, but with much more severe maximum punishments, including death penalty, which doesn't exist in regular legislation in Israel. Uh, uh, and they have also special offenses like membership or uh, operation or expressing support in terror organizations which are related to uh, the claim. The defense emergency regulation, the penal code of the defense emergency regulation is actually not used in Israel for the last 15 years. Okay? Because it is, a, it is a military court, it's a military system, if there is someone who is suspect, suspect terrorist activity within Israel, he or she will be tried according to the Prevention of Terrorism Act or according to the General Penal Code. There is no use almost in this uh, penal code in Israel proper, but there is a use of this procedure and penal code in the occupied territories. Operated until the early 80s. Yeah, but very, very, very few cases. Case. Case very few cases. Very few cases. It's also a legacy of the, uh, of the uh, military uh, regime that uh, was in force until 1966. 
this the Lord call it was active. Yeah. In between in the seven during the 70s it basically was very but you have the issues of the issue of Jerusalem. Well, technically speaking, Jerusalem is Israel. Yeah. Yeah. And Israeli law it is, but it's right. there is it's only highlights <laughs> every <laughs> question in this uh, uh, very general survey can really prompt a, a long discussion, but thanks for the remarks. Uh, the emergency day regulation, what is the more important part of this emergency regulation is administrative measures. First, the declaration of an organization as a terror organization, which is uh, 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 in the hands of the defense, Minister of Defense, and uh, very harsh measures uh, which are not basically punitive, which are supposed to be preventive uh, and uh, uh, are not decided by a proper court after due procedure and by, 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 by the administration. And these uh, measures include deportations, for example. This was abolished in Israel, uh, but still exists basically uh, in occupied territories. Uh, detention. Again, detention, according to defense regulation, was abolished within Israel and replaced by the detention law of 1979, agreed to detention law. Uh, but it still exists in uh, the occupied territories. Movement restrictions used a lot uh, during the military rule until 1966. House demolition, a very interesting story. I think there is somebody who's talking about house demolition. Brian, it's on the program. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about it. No, 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 no. Ah, not house demolition. Because house demolition is an interesting phenomenon uh, that because of court intervention in the 70s and 80s, the government military base, the army decided to stop using house demolition altogether. And we now see, following this lighter wave of uh, wave of terror attacks, but it's not suicide bombers or massive attacks by the terror organization. It's individual people that house demolition are utilized again, uh, probably because of political reasons and not really military need. And we sense in the Supreme Court that there is a strong contingent of judges who say, well, we have to discuss whether the whole issue of house demolition is constitutional. And under which condition? Uh, hmm? Under which condition? Under which condition? No, even the, the power itself, some judges, many uh, Mazuz, one of his remarks. Uh, and these are just, it's always in the minority and remarks, but this means that the court is going to treat the question of how demolition quite soon and decide in a large panel whether this is a valid. Uh, measure to be taken. Because how is I'm, you know, I, I'm mentioning here prevention and reaction. While administrative detention, you detain, detain a person who is suspected in terror activity that is going to happen, this kind of prevention thing, to put house demolition, place house demolition, this is what I'm saying, reaction here, but of course the argument is different. To say that house demolition is a preventive measure is not so easy. Uh, it is in the public rhetoric or our very right-wing government rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric of retaliation or retribution. Uh, although formally what is presented to the court is that house demolition is a deterrence, uh, meaning a deterrence mean, uh, to enforce members of family of the uh, potential terrorists not to carry the act and so forth so on. Uh, and therefore, uh, and, and according to the court, it can be used only as a deterrent and not as a human being. And, uh, we'll, we'll see developments in this regard. Um, as I said, the Supreme Court uh, uh, was willing to review uh, administrative uh, measures taken on the basis of the defense regulations from the very beginning, from 1948, from 1949. Initially only with regard to the procedure, whether these administrative measures were taken in the right procedure prescribed by the law, 
uh, new process and so forth and so on. But in the last 40 years, it also uh, is willing to interfere substantively with the discretion of the administration or the Minister of Defense when such orders are issued. Uh, and uh, even for that, pur for that purpose, it created the common law of a special procedural rule. Uh, and this is due to the fact that in many such cases, when a person is detained and he appeals against or he applies for a, a judicial review against his detention, uh, um, the state argues, you know, had we, had we been able to disclose the uh, evidence, we would have put this person to a regular trial, but we cannot disclose the evidence because this, their disclosure will affect state security. They are very, very classified <laughs> evidence, and the state actually calls, uh, uh, labels it evidence privilege, according to the evidence ordinance, and therefore the court cannot really examine the discretion of the authorities, uh, whether this detention deportation or how the condition is, is uh, justified. So the court already, uh, as I said, 40 years ago, suggested a procedure according to which, basically an inquisitorial procedure, according to which if the other party is willing, if the uh, uh, party applying for judicial review or this, uh, the, the, the party that is detained, demolished, and reported is willing and his uh, lawyer is willing, the court will look at the evidence without their presence and decide uh, uh, on the merit uh, according to the evidence. And this is a very interesting example <coughs> of common law procedure that was created by the court and was afterward adopted by the legislator. It is the procedure now in the 1979 uh, uh, administrative detention uh, uh, legislation and also in the new uh, anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism law that is going to get uh, 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 enforced on the 1st of November. So this is quite an interesting development. I'll mention it in a second. Okay. Um, we can talk about, uh, again, law on the ground, law in action in regard to deportation, a uh, similar story the Supreme Court decisions brought almost to stop, to the, the, the army to stop using uh, deportation as even as a preventive measure. Um, and this is an interesting, again, for those who do comparative perspective research or research of what is the Israeli law have to take into account uh, also this input of the court, which actually curtails very, very significantly the uh, usage of these draconian powers. Okay. A few words on the Prevention of Terrorism Act from 1949. Uh, um, really a few words because this law will be repeated uh, in two months. Uh, it was enacted, as I said, five days after the assassination of uh, the Baron uh, Bernadotte and was used to eliminate Lehi within three months of its operation. Again, it includes also a penal section and a domestic one. Uh, and uh, what is interesting that until the 1980s, it was hardly utilized, or it was utilized only against Jewish terror groups, Lehi and alike. And in the 1980s, it was discovered by the government. Uh, it was discovered by the government uh, in the a very side affair of uh, counter-terrorism law. It was a time in which Israelis from the left wing started to negotiate with the PLO, a meeting with the PLO, and the government regarded the PLO as a terror organization, although it was declared as a terror organization only in 1986, which is quite interesting according to the Professional Terrorism Act. But it was declared as a terror organization in, in order to prevent Israelis meeting with PLO uh, officials, and uh, the threat of these Israelis were uh, was that they would be uh, indicted according to the Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, uh, under the section of expressing support to a terror organization. So it's quite interesting that although Palestinian organizations were the main enemies uh, of uh, terror initiator 
uh, only 1986 the PLO was declared a terror organization, only in 89 Hamas and Hezbollah were declared a terror organization, and uh, the Provincial Terrorism Act was really not very uh, instrumental in the actual fight against terrorism. And what we have in 2005 is the first time that the Israeli legislature is really intervening uh, uh, and, and with a major comprehensive uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and this legislation is a response to the internalization of their activities and the very complicated financial aspects of funding or supporting a terror organization. Uh, and uh, it does, I will not elaborate because, again, this law is going to be reviewed once the, uh, the new counterterrorism law is incorporated. Yeah, incorporated into the new legislation. So, what are the main points regarding uh, the new counterterrorism law from uh, 2016? First of all, uh, and if we can talk about it, it is in force. Permanent. It is regular legislation, i.e., adopting the business as usual model, as opposed to the old law, which was only enforced during declaration of emergency. It has it's new legislation, so it has a very nice introductory sector, section one, which says that all the powers used by the government according to the law should uh, correspond to Israel's obligation to respect human rights and to international law, which is quite interesting because it, it is a section that will give the courts much more liberty to, uh, to review both the actual arrangements in the law and their application in certain in specific circumstances. So uh, this is, I think, an advantage of a modern legislation that it brings into affect international obligations, and uh, we can talk about it, it's basically not natural. Our, our uh, system is a dualistic system. Obligations of Israel according to international law, which are not incorporated by the Knesset, are not part of municipal law. One can look at this section as actually incorporating uh, uh, those obligations into uh, the Israeli uh, municipal legal system, so it might be a very, very instrumental section. And another thing that can be said about the law that it captures much broader activities under the roof of terror activity and terror organization, but it's much less draconic than uh, the previous legislation in terms of uh, the punishment, the maximum punishment in terms of uh, administrative measures regarding uh, uh, property, uh, which I will say a word in a second. Uh, and to the credit of the government, one can say that of the Minister of Justice or the Knesset that basically enacted this law, one can say that it includes much more sophisticated or balanced mechanisms of checks and balances with regard to the various measures that can be taken according to the law. For example, declaration of a terror organization which is a very, very instrumental thing because once you declare organization a terror organization, there are immense consequences for the organization and for the individuals connected with the organization. So declaration of an organization as a terror organization is still in the jurisdiction or power of the Minister of Defense, but it has to be made upon recommendation of the head of the General Secret Service and the approval of the Attorney General. Because not consultation. Approval of the Attorney General. So that was practiced. So the yeah, energy was practiced, but now it's entrenched the law. And there is an appeal procedure, a, a, a new appeal procedure by a committee, headed a three members committee, headed by a retired Supreme Court just appoint, a justice appointed by the Minister of Justice in consultation with the Supreme Court President. So again, the government really. Yeah, it, if things will deteriorate here uh, completely, the government can abuse the power. But if you have to uh, uh, go through an appeal committee, which is headed by retired Supreme Court judges, which is appointed in consultation with the current Supreme Court president, okay, this is likely to be 
an impartial and objective uh, appeal court. Of course, again, you could say, I don't want to, but this I think is important. It, on the one perspective, you could say, well, we are moving in the right direction in the sense of more checks and balances. But conversely, you could say it's a protection mechanism for the government. Why? Because to the extent that, as you said, everybody realizes the Supreme Court sitting as a high court of justice is going to be there, mm -hmm. to the extent that you have a betting of this body, which is going to be more pro government than the Supreme Court, one would assume, because the government has great control over the selection of its members, then the Supreme Court will find it more difficult to intervene finally in the decision. Therefore, it, it's, an, it's an interesting yeah, institutional mix. One can make this argument, as well as the argument, of course, that this legislation can proceed in more than a It's a regular legislation. Yeah, yeah there are pro and con, but, uh, but I think it's important to, to bring the factors. Okay? The counterterrorism law includes the penal section, okay, where uh, the offenses have more distinctions between different associations with terror organizations, from heading a terror organization, managing a terror organization, membership in a terror organization, providing support or funds to a terror organization, training, expressing support, uh, and failing to inform about terror organization activity. Uh, and as you see, the maximum punishments are much less severe than the old legislation, but that's still quite severe from uh, having a terror organization 25 to life, uh, depending on the variety of activities conducted by this organization, to expressing support in a terror organization, <coughs> which uh, impo can impose up to five years in prison. And here, again, there is a... <coughs> A small check and balance mechanism that every indictment, according of supporting, expressing support to the organization, can be approved individually or, or, or uh, private, it has to be approved, uh, approved by the Attorney General in order to balance uh, consideration of freedom of speech. And, but the law includes also a new methodology which I think is very worrying, which I don't think that anybody really talked about it yet. On top of these offenses, which are sui generis offenses, in not exist in the penal code, you have a definition of offense of terror, which is any offense committed with a specific intention, the intention was national, religious, or ideological motivations meant to create fear or panic among the public or in protest to offend the government or others or to take or refrain from taking particular action. So, what was dealt with in the past by the Israeli Supreme Court, whether terror activity can be regarded as terror activity by an individual person without an organization, so forth and so on, this is solved by this uh, definition that every offense, if there is a special motivation, will be regarded as an act of terrorism. So a theft, a burglary, if the intention was as such, can be regarded act of terror. And of course, what the meaning is, is that the procedure, the penal procedure, the criminal procedure is compromised. And we have privileged evidence, the arrangement that I talked about before, and the government can present evidence that they defendant cannot attack. And in certain cases, hearsay is admitted. There is no limitation. With, with no limitation. People can be uh, in custody before judicial or uh, uh, hearing up to 72 hours instead of 24 hours according to the regular uh, criminal procedure. Right? And this can be manipulated. Okay? If a person is uh, uh, arrested uh, or a theft, and there is a claim that this set was an act of terror, okay, in principle, this person can be held for 72 hours in his trial, uh, disclosed evidence, can, and so forth and so on. And this is about attorneys also. Mm -hmm. For example, attorneys is actually someone that is a family. Not meeting with an attorney. Yeah, which is a, a significant uh, issue. Uh, so basically, uh, what we have is an example of one of the general 
weaknesses of the business as usual model, that the emergency atmosphere and the emergency uh, uh, environment basically takes Absolutely. over takes over to no matter. Is there a definition of terror? Yes. What is terror? Is, yeah. Very definition of terror. It talks about Fear, conflicting fear, which is connected to uh, act of terror. As I said, any action that is motivated to create fear or panic among the public, or in purpose to compel the government or other authority to take or refrain from taking particular action, basically, okay, I'm sure that the Supreme Court will scrap this down, but if a person is wants to change the government policy with regard to uh, housing uh, and and uh, demonstrate or uh, uh, or captures uh, property uh, it, this definition can be applied yes. maybe, maybe the court will say this is not but, you're right. one, but the definition is quite broad um, what the law uh, <coughs> the new law said I will get to my conclusion in a second uh, and the administrative measures that the law enables, and there is a very extensive section with regard to property, which is on one hand much less draconic than the old regulation, and in this case also uh, many regulations from the defense emergency regulations were repealed, abolished, or will be abolished as for the first of November. But uh, it has a very broad definition of property that had been confiscated, uh, property that facilitated terror activities or used as reward, rewarding terror activities exposed. Uh, there is a possible review of an administrative court, uh, um, but uh, again, the procedure might be more checked and balanced, but uh, the scope of uh, confiscation of property uh, is, is quite big, bigger than in the old legislation, uh, as you said, we copied the 2005 financing of terror uh, uh, law. Uh, the law didn't touch the harsh administrative measures uh, that still remain in even in Israel proper. Uh, uh, that I mentioned before, like uh, demolition of houses uh, and restricting orders. And of course, this law also applies only to Israel property of the territories and the harsh measures of deportation and uh, <coughs> detention uh, are uh, still in force. And what is interesting that the law did not repeal the detention law, the 1970 detention law. Uh, mm -hmm. 1979 detention law, which is enforced only during declaration of emergency. So this might be the good news. That if the government will not think, oh, we made a mistake and we have to entrench this law to final normality and the emergency will be abolished, then there will be no administrative detention within this very proper. Okay. So to conclude, um, I would say that Israel generally maintains the formal facet of the rule of law uh, under extreme conditions, uh, specifically under extreme conditions created by uh, threats of terror. And it uses the combination of emergency constitution and business as usual, uh, business as usual, uh, with a shift to the latter because of the fact that the new counterterrorism law is going to be normal legislation and not only times of emergency. Uh, however, it did really touch the very, very sensitive uh, parts or the draconic parts of the defense regulation. Uh, so it didn't go as far as really repeating uh, what I think is perceived by many as the most crucial human rights violation uh, around the conflict, the Arab conflict. Um, and, uh, and the third point is that the courts, and I didn't have time to uh, elaborate on this court's decision, the courts, especially the Supreme Court, uh, 
assumed a very, very active role in the actual implementation of counter-terrorism law. Uh, and uh, not always uh, successfully, as you can see with regard to house demolition or some deportation cases, but I think that this is a very important ingredient of uh, the Israeli uh, corrective Israeli anti-terror uh, law. Characteristic. Um, in a sense, the new counterterrorism law imitates the American and the British, uh, maybe the Canadian, I don't know, don't know about the Canadian uh, legislation. Um, and of course, there are a lot of uh, policy or normative questions uh, whether counterterrorism law should be regarded as part of the rule of law under emergency or should be part of regular legislation, to what extent, maybe different parts of it, so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, of course, in the more general uh, area of the models, uh, the <coughs> possible models, what are the pro and cons based on the experience of the Israel, what are the pro and cons of the different models, and where maybe we should resort to the prerogative model, uh, business as usual, constitutional emergency, and so forth and so on. These are questions that we might uh, address, or some of them, in, in the course of this workshop. Um, so I will stop here, and we'll be happy to hear two or three questions. We can adjust a little bit. I know that I'm 10 minutes uh, extended my time. Is there any remarks, comments, questions? Very, very briefly, um, I think. Uh, thank you, Eli, for for this uh, for, for, for this uh, thorough introduction and also historical perspective. I think that uh, we see the dilemma here of the legislature. I think what Eli basically said is, is a story of three things. The first thing is the dilemmas of the legislature. The legislature wants to think of itself as a democratic legislature, cares about human rights. But on the other hand, there is terror. So you, you could do one of two things. You can define terror very narrowly and then give greater powers. Because if terror is defined narrowly, then you could say, okay, if it's really terror, terror, then okay, we can release the hounds and then we can attack them. But then there's a problem because uh, you can address less issues, or you can define it more broadly and then limit the powers of the government, or include more checks and balances over each power, which is what the Israeli is. So you broaden the definition, you include severe powers, but less severe than more than, 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 than were before, and you include the uh, bureaucratization of, of, of these powers. You have to apply to this agency, and that agency, and you have to be reviewed by this and by that. But it's a dilemma. Okay, so the, the first dilemma is how to deal with this uh, 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 legal. The, the, the second dilemma, I think, has to do with the story that the story of the tells us is what do we think about the rule of law that relates to the question. Here, I think, what I learned from this is that as far as the formal rule of law, Israel is very clear, everything has to be legalized. Even though within Israel there were some, there were some who said, well, let's not legalize it. Let's leave some, some things beyond the law, outside the law. But it's not the question is really very interesting in that from the last decade. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You have a, a culture of illegalism. I know, the court, court, I don't know. Yeah. The court reacted. Yeah. But de facto, what happened? The court may react. That's the third element. Of that. the court, the, the, I, I'll get to the court. That's the third one. So the second point has to do with what do we think about the rule of law. So the formally, the formal question is whether we have a legal structure and whether we just say, okay, we're going to step outside the rule of law. But the substantive question is more interesting. And Eli proposed one way to think about substantive rule of law, which is separation of powers and commitment to the rights. These are the two basic ingredients. There's a, a, different, just a, a different definition of substantive rule of law that talks more broadly about justification. And, and there are two prongs to this definition. Justification is a positive metric that something is justified to the extent that the population thinks it's justified. Right. So positive just 
And there's normative justification saying, okay, it could be justified to the extent that there are normative reasons, only reasons. And we don't evaluate the reason necessarily at the liberal conception of the right, or, but there got to be reasons that, that address some form of moral theory. Now here you can say that communism is also a moral theory that, that actually views rights as the enemy and not the answer. But Johannes and other thinkers view that. And then it can be justified to talk about Russia China. It can be just as long as it is justified under some political theory, not necessarily the one that, that's about separation of power and right, then substantive rule of law is 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 met. And Rawls, in his, you know, some, some of his work about, about the bargaining with, with the type of bargaining that we should do with non-liberal democracy, with non-liberal uh, 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 regimes, talks about, you know, the, the, the limits. So I think this should interest us because terrorism, what you think about terrorism, and I'll be brief about that, is that it uses, all terrorists view themselves as freedom fighters, right? That's the point. Uh, that, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Nobody says, okay, I have a right to be a terrorist. Lehi didn't say, ah, we want to kill people because we enjoy the process of killing them. Ah, that's, uh, we have a moral right to go and kill people because we think it's fine. People say, well, these are measures that, that, that are required because of the oppression, because of the violation of our rights, because of the. Uh, okay, so then, now the question is, how do you tolerate the those, those issues. And this is why the question of, of, of substantive rule of law matters. Because the state itself uses illiberal methods to deal with an illiberal activity, but both apply to a grander normative justification. The state or applies to, or the state, yeah, the state applies to the, the normative theory of we gotta defend ourselves, and then the terrorist applies to the normative theory of we gotta, we gotta claim our rights against oppression. <clears throat> the third, very briefly, the third point that I take from Ellie has to do with the institutional design and the judicial review of the Israeli story. Judicial review. And here it's very complex. Um, I think it's interesting. On the one hand, I think Ellie very uh, acutely um, and correctly described the Israeli scenario under which the court is present basically everywhere. You don't, you don't have, I think Israel is unique in that sense. You don't have issue of action. You don't have things that are beyond justiciability. Everything is justiciable in Israel. Standing is very broad. And basically, you can go to court any time with respect to anything. The fact. The question then becomes how the court manages its discretion. When to intervene, with respect to what to intervene, do you have, and here the dilemma is do you have two distinct doctrines? Ah, this is the doctrine for emergency. Judicially speaking, and this is a doctrine for normal time, or you have the same doctrine. And if you have the same doctrine, do you apply it differently, saying, ah, it's the same doctrine. But under emergency, the value of these features within the doctrine changes, but the same doctrine. And, and but if it's not an emergency, we apply the doctrine, the same doctrine, differently. And we see the court not being coherent. If, if you really look at the cases, there is a terrorism case, and also all kinds of religions. Mean the court is not uh, is not uh, coherent. Sometimes they say oh, it's a different the doctrine because it's emergency. Sometimes they say the same doctrine but we apply it differently. Sometimes they say it's the same doctrine and should not apply it differently because something is different here. And, and there's always a risk, and I pointed it to to a crossover. And I finish with this. We see with respect to, with respect to the right of fair hearing. The right of fair hearing was established in Israel under administrative law. There was a case of deportation. The right to a fair hearing.
And though it is very broad indeed, um, the question is how do we apply it? Not only how do we interpret it, but also how do we apply log theft? And now it is true that in theory, a reactive theft may be used this way, and the NSA has done similar kind of things in the US, but uh, doubtful if uh, someone tests something like that past the Israeli Supreme Court. So I don't know to what extent this is a substantive concern, a concern of significance. So what, what I, in some way, I just wanted to say is that I think there is also another checks and balances system uh, that is in place whether or not we want it or, or we don't want it. I think there is another way to go about the conditions of this. Very interesting remark, uh, maybe two or three points in response. First, uh, from a <coughs> very formal Keynesian perspective, international law that is in fact in Israel is customary international law, which has done in fact, and international law that was approved by the Israeli legislature. But on the grounds we see from the 70s much more use of international law, even as an interpretive a guideline, even if this part of specific international law is not incorporated in the Israeli system. So there is a trend of the Supreme Court to take into account international law. Form. Second point is that international law is very vague in many of these issues. So you can you know, uh, take this and take that, and uh, uh, it's uh, it, international law doesn't solve all. The, the, the questions that are confronted by these ways. The third point, which I think is important to say, that both the courts and more important, the government, wants to avoid the situation that it will have to answer in international freedom. So there is a political science game here, okay, that the government will always restrain itself, as well as the court will give the correct reasoning in its decisions that will be on the threshold of the international community or the international court uh, uh, enforcement community to say, well, they have sufficient procedures, institutions, independent institutions to enforce international law in the domestic courts without this. No. Uh, uh, there was a, a piece in the paper uh, two days ago that the government is going to allow the special aid prosecutors to come to the to Israel and to the occupied territories. This is a change of the Israeli government policy. And I think this is in, in line with this kind of a game that uh, the governments will never cross a border that will bring it to be. Uh, defensive, uh, defendant in uh, international tribunal or, or uh, the government is a government or specific in, in, in the region. So I think that these are three important complements uh, that first can explain the increasing use utilization of international law in principle in Israeli. Uh, and you know, the judges also, there's also a, a thing of the international community of democratic judges. Judges, the Israeli Supreme Court judges meet every year, judges of the Constitution Court in Germany, there is an annual meeting and there is a meet, uh, meeting the British Supreme Court justices and American and Canadian, and exchange. there is something in the last decade of creation of this judicial elite that the Israeli judges very much want to be part of, uh, uh, and this, from a political science perspective, will prevent them from you know, crossing the lines, one can say, uh, uh, that will bring uh, Israel to the international tribunals. One short comment on that. Um, you mentioned international tribunals and courts. I don't think that the Israeli authorities are that great for international uh, courts because basically we're talking about the ICJ that doesn't have any, any ability to do anything with Israel. And the ICC, which deals with war crimes, which are not related to this mechanism. But on the other hand, we do have the, oh, the review mechanism within public international law, the Human Rights Committee, and we have the Human Rights Council, which is a universal periodical review. So you have different mechanisms that will overlook the Israeli fulfillment of international law and make sure that, and then rebuke Israel for the use of uh, this kind of legislation 
or even the inaction of the enactment of this legislation even before um, seeing in practice. So we have some kind of overview mechanism that will ensure that Israel will or not necessarily ensure but overview yes. that Israel leave. So it's not necessarily the cause but the other mechanism. Okay, every other? So, oh, we are 